Hello! Today I'm taking a look at an avian species synonymous with the universe of Final Fantasy, and one of the biggest signifiers and consistencies to appear in each numerical game. Much like the Summons, Gilgamesh and Sid, who I've discussed previously, Chocobos receive subtle reworkings and varying roles for each instalment, but a consistent presence that makes them familiar and perhaps an essential expectation, particularly for long-time players of the games. Now, I had been intending to take a short break and finish up some long-form reviews, but weirdly, I was in a natural history museum in Vienna a few days ago, and while walking around the dinosaur exhibit, I found a reconstruction of this creature called a terror bird, and I photographed this, and I'll put it up on the screen and leave it there um, for a bit. But my instant reaction to seeing this thing was, that looks exactly like a chocobo, <laughs> at least it does to my eyes. Uh, I started wondering about the chocobos, and you know, I was thinking about discussing them at some point anyway. So it just made me interested to discuss the origins and the potential inspirations for this creature. So turning to the origins here, and referencing these, these birds I saw, uh, they were known as forest rhapsody which were kind of massive dinosaur birds that inhabited South America. And there was also the slightly smaller um, Gastronis, which were a species that inhabited Europe. Um, and there were two of these models there, and the Gastronis was kind of small. But, you know, the Forest Rassidy one, which is the one I photographed, you know, it was quite big and it looked like something that you could potentially ride. So, again, I was like, well, you know, the dimensions are familiar to how chocobos are to humans in, in Final Fantasy. So that was kind of cool. But upon seeing it, I was, I was, you know, I started thinking about, you know, the other inspirations to Final Fantasy and the known influences to Final Fantasy. And I think I might have mentioned this last year because I discussed um, the Studio Ghibli film, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. And this was a massively influential film that Hironobu Sakaguchi, who was the former director of, and creator of Final Fantasy, was a big fan of. You know, if we look at Final Fantasy in a certain way, you know, we have the airships and all of this sort of technological steampunk stuff, which is drawn straight from Ghibli. Um, but also in Nausicaa, there was these birds known as horse claws. And these were apparent both in the manga of Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind and also the movie. So we see these birds known as horse claws, which are utilised as modes of transport and also cavalry units, much like in Final Fantasy and much like how horses have been used in the real world. And as it turns out, the aforementioned historic birds I saw in the museum were influences for the creation of the horse claws, rather than directly the chocobos. But of course, if the horse claws influenced Hironobu Sakaguchi, which I think they did, in a roundabout way, you know, we do have this going back to these weird dinosaur things, which is kind of interesting. Now, over the years, I mean, I think, Nausicaa, Nausicaa came out in about 87, um, and over the years, this, this link and this inspiration from the Ghibli franchise, both in terms of horse claws and airships and, you know, these other influences, it's become quite tenuous and you, people don't really identify it anymore. But by contrast, the appeal and the status of the Chocobos has kind of grown into its own entity, and they've ballooned in popularity to become this iconic entity in a in and out of, of itself. And every time you see one, you're like, oh, Final Fantasy, you know, it's become this signifier, you know, of the series on its own, almost to the same degree as kind of Mario and Sonic are like these these signifiers for their respective games. Chocobos have become this emblem by themselves. And, you know, quite unlike any other creature to be found in the Final Fantasy series, Chocobos have been awarded their own spin-off titles, such as Chocobo Racing, Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon, which were relatively well received, you know, um, at the time of their release. And they've since achieved a sort of cult status about them. And also we have little spin-off curios such as Chocobo World and anyone that owns the Steam version of Final Fantasy VIII, you know, you, you have the ability to play um, the previously Japanese-only uh, Chocobo World, which is just a funny little, you know, 8-bit game. Not even that, it's a really basic game featuring Boko the Chocobo. So these spin-offs that hinge around Chocobos are just further evidence of how they've achieved this kind of cult following and they've been elevated above other occurrences in Final Fantasy, such as Sid and Gilgamesh, and even the Mughals, which are relative constants throughout the games too. So 
Turning to the Chocobos, they made their official debut in Final Fantasy II uh, alongside the equally iconic theme, uh, Waltz the Chocobo, which was, of course, composed by Nobu Yamatsu. And in this first entry, they were utilised for their most common attribute, which is a rudimentary form of transport on the world map, which generally flee once you dismount them. In Final Fantasy III, we saw a massive leap forward in their significance, with Chocobos being a learnable summon, which was something that was included in Final Fantasy IV, V, VII, and VIII. And three, <clears throat> sorry, uh, and three also introduced the recurring chubby Chocobo or fat Chocobo, depending what game you play. And this again appears in each subsequent game up until Final Fantasy IX, and is referenced in a few other games, uh, including Final Fantasy XV. Now, while Final Fantasy IV was significant in that it introduced the multicoloured breeds of Chocobo with their own specific attributes um, and geography tra- traversability, which was most famously reiterated in Final Fantasy VII, I think, it was really Final Fantasy V that was a turning point for these creatures and injected a degree of personality into them with the introduction of Bolko, who is a con- close companion of Bats. And... Boko has his own little story arc in his relationship with Bats, and also with his partner Coco, with whom he breeds in the game. But also inching outside of Final Fantasy V, Boko has numerous references and callbacks to his initial appearance. You know, he's referenced in Final Fantasy IX, Final Fantasy Tactics, and he's also cast as the protagonist of the aforementioned Chocobo world. Now, until this point, uh, Final Fantasy V, Chocobos had been synonymous with the world map, Uh, Chocobo forests and a result and reward of exploration and capture, which is how they're also established as secondary features of both Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy IX. Uh, Final Fantasy VI, however, had them as purchasable and rentable elements of gameplay. And, you know, you go to certain towns and locations and, you know, you can rent a Chocobo and ride it around the world. And this is the first instance of human intervention by way of breeding, domestication, and commercial utilisation in the Final Fantasy universe. You know, much like horses in the medieval times in the real world, as I mentioned earlier. And this was taken a giant leap forward in Final Fantasy VII, with among the most infamous side quests of any Final Fantasy, which is the Chocobo breeding and Chocobo racing minigames, which were available from uh, Chocobo Bill and the, the Gold Saucer, respectively. Now, Final Fantasy VII gave Chocobos probably the largest inclusion by way of side quests up until Final Fantasy XV, and the coveted Gold Chocobo was a major task to acquire and a catalyst to obtaining the Knights of the Round Summon material. And on this note, actually, uh, uh, just digressing on side quests, because I was thinking about this, I was talking about it uh, with a guy at work uh, the other day, and, you know, this guy's in his late 30s, this guy I work with, and he was telling me that you know, this advent of multiple long-winded side quests, uh, particularly in RPG games, was sort of a... Well, he he felt it was part of a developer marketing technique which encouraged gamers to purchase strategy guides, you know, before the advent of Google and FAQ websites. And I found that quite an interesting little, um, I suppose, piece of culture and gaming history because you know i collect the strategy guides but it's because i like looking at the artwork and stuff um but really thinking about it you know beyond word of mouth or strategy guides would anyone really know how to acquire yuffie or vincent or these obscure materials you know without the aid of a guidebook in 1997 you know it's interesting to think about but uh, regardless of the purpose of side quests, you know, I, I personally really enjoy the longevity and the, the engagement they offer to to these old games, and um, particularly the Final Fantasy games and the Chocobo breeding quest. You know, as a prime example of this, which I think was done really well. Now, moving on to Final Fantasy VIII, which, along with Final Fantasy IX, somewhat marginalised the Chocobos to something you don't really need to encounter if you don't want to. And as I mentioned in my Final Fantasy VIII review, you essentially see them in Windhill. And you see them as part of the confused magic. But aside from that, you can essentially just skip the forests if you're focused on the main story. And in terms of Final Fantasy IX, and similar to Bolko in Final Fantasy V, you obtain a single chocobo known as Choco, 
who can be utilized across the world you know if we if you choose to do the forest side quests again and similar to final fantasy 8 chocobos are seen sporadically throughout the game such as powering the mist machines at dali um, but not so much you know aside from that moving on to final fantasy 10 the penchant for worldwide travel you know synonymous with the chocobos usually was completely negated in this game by the linearity and stunted explorability of the gameplay and i remember this being a cause of complaint at the time of the release because chocobos are essentially confined to the calm lands and certain high roads such as uh where the chocobo eater is i think it's the mehen high road i can't remember but you know they're confined to these specific areas and you know once more particularly in the calm lands the chocobos are facets of side quests that allow you to obtain Tidus's celestial weapon and go to fight Belgamine uh, once more to get the Mega Sisters, I think it is. But I think the interesting image of Chocobos in Final Fantasy X is how, similar to Final Fantasy Tactics, they're utilised as cavalry units and there's an excellent FMV during Operation Mehen that shows the armoured Chocobos kind of charging into the fray and are small moments of interaction with Lucille, Elmer and Clasco, who are the, you know, the, um, the Chocobo Knights, we get to see these cool looking armoured Chocobos up close, which isn't something that, that's featured in a lot of Final Fantasy games. Now, on the note of tactics and also Final Fantasy XII, these Ivalice games posit the Chocobos not only as obtainable aspects of travel, but also recurring wild creatures that you have to fight against every so often. And the distinction between wild Chocobo and tame and enemy and friend with these birds is crystallised in a short piece of dialogue in War of the Lions, in which we're told that the walk sound that chocobos make is a signal that they're wild, and the cue sound that they make is a signal uh, that they've become tamed, which is an interesting bit of Final Fantasy lore that isn't widely established across these series, and it's only this one piece of dialogue I've ever found that kind of establishes that. So, uh, moving on to Final Fantasy XIII, this sees chocobos equally partitioned up into wild and tame, with many being bred and domesticated on Cocoon, and wild ones running freely on Grand Pulse. The the morale meter um, is something that's quite innovative, and frequent encounters will see a chocobo flee from the scene. And I always found both Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy X to have the more muscular, formidable-looking chocobos, just as a aesthetic note on them Uh, you know rather than the more cutesy looking cartoonish ones we see in uh, 6, 7 and 8 for example now uh, Final Fantasy 11 and Final Fantasy 14 due to being MMOs have a much larger scope for the inclusion of chocobos with breeding and raising and you know racing being prominent facets of the game but once again you know my limited experience with the MMOs prevents me from commenting too heavily on this and you know I wouldn't want to feign my knowledge of it but you know, they, you know, due to the nature of the MMO and the, the sprawling narratives and side quests and things like that, you know, the chocobos are quite well explored in that. You know, if you choose to go go down that route. And finally, um, kind of wrapping up on this brief overview, we have Final Fantasy XV, which revives much of Final Fantasy VII's racing, and also in the Comrades patch, uh, chocobo, you know, chocobos can now be raised as well as a mini game. And on a note of Final Fantasy XV, I found because it's got this sprawling open world, real time sort of layout, you know, chocobos are actually really useful and they have this sort of renewed necessity to them that kind of waned and became absent, particularly on the, you know, from the from the PlayStation to the PlayStation 2 at least. Um, and they have this enormous value in Final Fantasy XV, which hasn't been seen for quite, for quite some time, as I said. And the introduction of the rental system, which times into it ties into Final Fantasy XV's time time based day and night cycle and things like that. So you know you rent a chocobo for a number of days. I actually found that like a really good system, and it was you know quite intuitive and and neat to kind of use. So there we have it. Uh, wrapping up now, we've kind of looked briefly at how chocobos are significant and a recurring factor of Final Fantasy that have origins in you know, the Studio Ghibli franchise and, you know, in a roundabout way, prehistoric animals, which is 
kind of crazy. But whether appearing as transport or summon or side quest or enemy, the chocobos are emblematic of the, the series and have this ica- iconic status that you know has been built over the years. So what do you think? Drop a comment, start a conversation. Let me know your thoughts on chocobos.